realize how many people are out in these fields watching us, but like... You can hear everybody. It's like, a, it's like uh, Earth me, just won the Super Bowl. What's your stick? Well, the weekend violence in Charlottesville. Breaking news, CNN, exclusive. North Korea launched another missile this morning. The test ended in Israel. Republican and Republican are well aware of the use of the conflict to provide security. Some players are accustomed to jump that way. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I was in college, uh, my family lived for a time in Orlando, Florida. And for part of that time when they lived in Florida, they lived right on a small lake. So somewhere along in there, my father got a hold of or acquired a small little sailboat and taught himself to sail on that little lake. Well, one summer when I was home from school, I developed a, a kind of an interest in a young lady at church. Wasn't the le- young lady I eventually married. Wasn't lucky enough to meet her yet, but just someone I was interested in. So I thought it would impress her if I invited her over and took her sailing on the lake. You know, I could be the swashbuckling sea captain, I mean, I've been out with my dad a couple times and figured, you know, how hard it could it be? My dad can sail. So I asked him if I invite her over, can I take my date out on the boat? And he said, sure, but there are a couple things you need to remember. And then he went and started to tick off this list of things about sailing that I really didn't pay much attention to. You know, dad, blah, 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 do this, do that, do the other. How hard could it be? So I invited her over, jumped on the boat, and we took off, set sail. It was perfect. The wind is blowing. I was the swashbuckling captain of the sea. And that boat blew straight across the lake into like 10 foot high reeds on the other side. I was doing the rudder like crazy, it wouldn't steer. It just went straight across, we blew straight across into the reeds. So I had to awkwardly climb out of the boat up the neck deep water in this lake, grab the rope and I walk that boat all the way back around through the reeds with her sitting in it (laughs) till I got back to our home. And when I got there, my dad was standing on the beach waiting. And so I crawled out soaking wet. I think the young lady went inside. I don't remember ever seeing her again, but I (laughs) stayed with my dad and I was steaming. He just grinning. I was steaming. I said, your boat's broken. It doesn't work. He went, did you put the keel down? How many of you know what a keel is? (laughs) Well, I didn't either at that time. (laughs) I said, "Uh, keel? He said, yeah, if you don't put the keel, it's this big long board that you have to put down into the water or else you can't steer the boat. It just slides across the water, even if you're working the rudder. And I was like, oh. And to this day, which is over 40 years later, my dad still teases me about the day I took the boat for a walk, he said. (laughs) We're in a series now called Jesus is Greater Than, and we're studying the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, a letter of encouragement and challenge to some ancient Jewish background Christians who were facing a time of suffering and persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire, and they're in danger of turning away from their faith in Christ. And last week, Pastor Jeff began in chapter 1 by uh, telling us that Jesus is the greater word. That's what the writer says. Jesus is the greater power. Jesus is the greater salvation because he made purification for sin. That's all covered in the first four verses of chapter one of the letter to the Hebrews. And today, we're gonna look at the danger of spiritual drift. The danger of spiritual drift. Hebrews chapter one, I'm gonna begin in verse five. We'll read a little bit, then I'll pause to explain, and then we'll go on uh, to what we're gonna study today. Hebrews chapter one, verse five. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. You're gonna hear a lot of talk of angels here. I'll explain it in just a minute. 
Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Verse 13, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I want to pause there. Now, the author has already said that Jesus is greater than all the prophets who've come before. And now he takes some time to say Jesus is also greater than the angels. Now, why so much talk about angels? It seems a little weird, at least to us in our culture. Now, angels are mysterious and fascinating. Uh, there are all kinds of images and superstitions uh, about angels flying about in our culture. That, that pun is partly intended, by the way. But what do we really know about angels? Did you know the Bible talks about angels over 270 times? And it tells us that angels are spiritual beings created before the creation of the universe by God for two main purposes. Angels are, first of all, messengers of God. They're messengers throughout Scripture. For example, at the birth of Christ, who announced his birth? Angels, right? The choir of angels, the heavenly host. So they are messengers, but secondly, Primarily, they simply worship God around the throne. They worship God's majesty. And that's all we really know for sure from Scripture. But it seems that by the time of the writing of the letter to the Hebrews, uh, some had become more than fascinated with angels. Uh, they had begun actually to look to angels to help them in their circumstance, maybe even worshiping angels. And that's a problem, he says, because Jesus is greater than the angels. No matter how interesting they might be, Jesus is greater. Now for us today, this might be the equivalent of what you would call sort of pop spirituality. You know, the latest fad to kind of capture people's spiritual interests. You know, Jesus is just so old school, so old fashioned. Uh, what about uh, modern spiritual ideas, you know, like crystals or Zen meditation or reincarnation or Kabbalah or astrology, you know, more modern things. The author's reminding them and us, no, 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 no. Jesus is greater. And now he introduces his main concern in this part of the letter. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since Jesus is greater, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, I'll explain that in a moment, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to, by, uh, to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I'm going to pause there. First thing the author is warning about or talking about is the potential for spiritual drift. The potential for spiritual drift. During my years in student ministries, I was always looking for creative ways to help high school and middle school students understand something about biblical truth. And one little game I found in a magazine or a book um, worked well almost every time I used it. I used it five or six times over the years. You would take one student out of the room and blindfold them. And then you'd tell the rest of the students left in the room what was going to happen. You'd say, okay, so-and-so is blindfolded. When we bring him or her back into the room, they have to walk through a maze made by the students in the room. They, they'd line themselves up all in a maze, set up obstacles, chairs, and stuff. And the, per, the blindfolded person is going to have to navigate all the way to a safe place, kind of to, or like to salvation, to a safe place, to a goal. And the only voices they can follow are all your voices. But all of you are going to try to confuse this person except one. And we designate whichever person that was who would always tell them the right way to turn. But all the other voices are hollering, left, left, turn left, you're going the wrong way. But there was one voice and the person with blindfold had to determine, had to listen hard to find the one voice they could trust. What was interesting is they almost always would eventually hear that voice. And once they heard it, no matter how soft it was with all the sounds, they could follow it all the way through. They could follow that voice. Perhaps, that little game has perhaps uh, never been more relevant than now in our culture. 
Our world is full of so many voices, so much noise, mainstream media, print media, TV, internet. We're bombarded with voices 24-7. You know, back in the day, if you're near my age or generation, you know, we used to have the news. Every night, the news, Walter Cronkite. That's the way it is. And we trusted, that was the news. Now we have real news and fake news, and who can tell the difference? On top of that, we have social media, which seems like anti-social media half the time. Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and everybody's yelling and arguing and yelling and arguing, and then tomorrow it starts up all over again. What voices do we listen to? Who do we pay attention to? The writer of the Hebrews is telling us that the world has always been full of many, many voices. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away from it. Now, the Greek word translated drift here is a nautical term. I think the writer grew up near water, was familiar with water. It means to flow by. It pictures a boat or a ship that's drifting past the dock, drifting past the landing area because the captain is sort of asleep at the wheel. But what's he talking about? He's talking about the potential for spiritual drift. Now, he's just finished establishing that Jesus is greater. He's the greater word because he's the final word that God spoke. He's the greater power. He upholds the entire universe by the word of his power. He's the greater salvation because he himself made purification for sins. And now, due to persecution and suffering, this second generation of Jewish background Christians is becoming disillusioned and confused In a sense, they're caught up in a current that's causing them to drift. The current is the current of suffering or fear and doubt, all of which makes us think, so what are the currents in our world, in our North American suburban culture that are strong enough to cause spiritual drift? There's a great German word that's used in theology and philosophy that some of you will recognize. The word is zeitgeist, and it means the spirit of the time or the spirit of the age. Not the spirit of God, but the spirit of the age. So what is the spirit of our age? What are the forces at work? Well, first of all, there's something I would call the spirit of speed or busyness. The sheer velocity of our suburban lives sometimes causes us to drift. Or what about the spirit of affluence that some would call affluenza? Our pursuit of wealth, pursuit of entertainment and recreation. We just have better things to do sometimes. As Bill Gates once famously said, I don't go to church because that hour is not a cost-effective use of my time. But for me, maybe the most powerful current in our world today is what I would call our cultural gospel, which goes like this. Find your own truth. Be true to yourself. Salvation and meaning and purpose and hope is found in being true to your true self. I want to speak just for a moment to those of you who are students today. Maybe you're in middle school, maybe you're in high school, on your way to college, and maybe you're in college, and you're in a secular university, a state university. Let me tell you something. From the moment you step on that campus, unless you're going to a faith-based school, from the moment you step on that campus, you're going to be routinely told in all kinds of different ways, that the Bible, what you've been taught your whole life is a fairy tale. You're gonna be told that Jesus is just another figure in religious history, no different than anyone else, that Christianity is just a religion, and that religion is the cause of most of the evil and suffering in the world. That's what you're gonna be told from the moment you step on campus. Listen to me. The Bible's not a fairy tale. It's anchored in history. Read it, study it for yourself. Study science, study geography, study archaeology, study history. It's all there. It's not a fairy tale. Jesus is not just any figure in religious history. He's the center of the entire universe. And Christianity is not a religion. Properly understood, it's a relationship with the living God. So think. Look out at the world. Something's wrong with the world. The Bible tells us what's wrong. So hang on, hang on to the truth you have heard because the current is strong and without an anchor, we drift. And that leads us to the second point, which is the danger of spiritual drift. Danger of spiritual drift. And the little story I told about taking a sailboat for a walk, the reason of drifting was clear and dramatic. Failure to put the keel down in the water. Had no way to steer the boat. 
But the truth is, that's not how most spiritual drift happens. Spiritual drift is far more subtle than that, and I think, therefore, far more dangerous than that. Uh, while preparing uh, this message, I was uh, reading, came across something that, that airplane pilots and, and sailors on the sea all know, and sometimes it's called the one degree rule. It means if you're going somewhere and you're just one degree off course, um, what happens? If your trip is short, if you're traveling, say, 100 yards, you would miss by just a little over five feet. No big deal. If you're one degree off and you're going uh, maybe a mile, you're going to miss by 92 feet. Okay? Still not a huge deal. But let's say you're going to Chicago, like Wrigley Field, 50 miles. You're going to be almost a mile off course by the time you get there. And that's a problem. You're not going to get in until about the second inning. You know, I think you get my point. That it's even one degree off. The farther you travel, the further you get away from the intended target. And spiritually speaking, that means spiritual drift is the further and further we get from God, the closer we get to destruction. Hebrews 2 again tells us, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Okay, now this is a sobering warning. First of five we'll see in the book of Hebrews. And it uses stunningly strong language. First, who is the we here? Four times the author says we, we, we. Who's we? Well, this letter is clearly written to the church. So the writer is clearly talking to people who we would call believers, Jewish background Christians who have heard and have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's talking to us. What does he mean by the message declared by the angels? That sounds a little odd to us. Well, his Jewish readers would have known clearly what he meant. They would have assumed he's talking about the law, what we would call the Ten Commandments of God, that God gave to Moses for the people of Israel back in the book of Exodus. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not murder. You shall not steal, etc., etc. Because in Jewish tradition, God used angels, remember they were messengers, to deliver the tablets to Moses to take to the people. So the people saw the message of the angels was the law. And the purpose of the law was to establish God's holiness and authority and to make clear what God wanted for his people, how we should live. But the law did not and does not keep people from sin or else the whole world would be perfect, but it's not. That's why it says every transgression received just retribution. That is, when you disobey God's law, when we sin against God, it has its consequences. So the law actually served to demonstrate the gap between the holiness of God and human brokenness or sin. That's why God gave the sacrificial system to his people, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So animals were sacrificed. The blood, the blood atoned for the sins of the people. We'll talk more about this in just a few weeks. Here's what's happening. The author of Hebrews is setting angels and the law up against the gospel of Jesus. He's saying to those who have heard the gospel and believed and received salvation through Christ's sacrifice, so you want to go back to the law? You want to go back to the angels and the law? The law is that which condemns you. Have you forgotten Jesus is the one who saves you? Did you see the story that came out of Houston last week? I wonder if you did. I saw it. The story was of an anonymous man. He's crawling on top of that car right there. Who, from the, from the safety of dry ground, saw these cars being submerged in water as it rose. So he waded out neck deep in water and started climbing on cars looking for people trapped inside. P they said the onlookers were hollering at him, hey, come back, come back, it's too dangerous, you're gonna drown, come back. And he kept yelling back, I'm not coming back till I check every single car, and he's by himself. I saw that story, it was moving on several levels, but it made me think, that's a picture of Jesus in a way. The writer of Hebrews is saying, why would you stay in the submerged car? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, what does neglect here mean? 
Well, for those who have not yet put their faith in Christ, and there would have been some in the church in those days just investigating, trying to figure it out, it means they are not yet saved. They're still in the car. It means they're risking eternal separation from God. Now, let me speak just for a moment. If you're out there and you're trying to figure it out, you're wrestling with faith. The question is, what or who are you counting on to save you? Are you counting on following your own truth, the cultural gospel? Just follow your truth, be true to yourself. Be a good person, go to church a couple times a year. Bible teaches, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, greater than everything else, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Don't stay in the car. But like we said, the writer's talking primarily to people who are already Christians. What does it mean for believers to neglect? Think of a marriage for a moment. Let's just say a husband neglects his wife emotionally, relationally, just neglects. Doesn't mean he's not married. It means he neglects. It means it brings a sense of distance, a sense of, of, of pain, maybe conflict, loss of joy, loss of intimacy. Well, the same thing happens in our relationship with God. To neglect our salvation doesn't mean we're not saved. You can't lose your salvation once you believe, but it does mean there can be consequences. We can forfeit the joy of that relationship, the peace of that relationship. We can fail to grow, fail to live and experience the life of Christ. And maybe it happens like this. At some point you heard and understood the gospel. So you came to faith, you opened your heart to Christ, you were baptized even, you're excited, but then you, know, you went off to college and then got a job and life got busy and complicated and it's hard to find the time or energy to go to church or to remember to pray and you miss one week, then you miss two, then it becomes a month, then it becomes a decade and you drift. So how do you get back to shore? How do we get back? Third thing the author talks about is the cure for spiritual drift. What's the cure? Well, when I took the boat out for a walk that day so long ago, I drifted across the lake, was in the reeds, faced the humiliating task of walking that boat all the way along back home just because I didn't pay attention. I didn't pay attention to just four little words, put the keel down. So if we've drifted spiritually, how do we get back on course? He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. Pay closer attention to what? to what we've heard, to the gospel. Then he says, it was declared at first by the Lord. That means the gospel came from Jesus himself. It was attested to us by those who heard. It came to us from eyewitnesses, men like Peter and James and John. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. What he's saying is, you've heard, you've seen the impact with your own eyes. For me, that would be like last Sunday afternoon, right here, we baptized 46 people who all gave their stories of transformation. 46, he's saying, you saw that, you know it's real, you know the power of the gospel, so pay attention. The Apostle Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 15, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now I know, I know, we hear that sometimes and go, yeah, 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 I heard all that back in Sunday school. Jesus loves me, this I know. Um, kind of like those pre-flight instructions on airplanes, you know. This aircraft is equipped with six emergency exits, two out, two four, good. Blah, 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 blah. Or they say, you know, in the unlikely event of loss of cabin pressure, an oxygen mask will drop down the floor, blah, blah, blah. I mean, who listens to that, right? Until there's turbulence. The first bump you feel, you go, oh, what did they say? Where, 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 what did they say? Where? Because it's important. The author of Hebrews is saying, no, no, no. Pay attention. Don't drift. Jesus came, lived, died, rose again to give you a new heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. And it's all a gift of faith, but if you drift, if you neglect, if you fail to pay attention, you run the risk of forfeiting that peace, that security, the joy of your salvation. Came across this story. That's how we're going to end today. But a man named Robert Robinson lived in 18th century England. 
As a young man, he was far from God, had lost his father, wandered far from God, part of street gangs and so forth. But at age 20, he heard a sermon by a famous preacher named George Whitfield, and he surrendered his life to Christ and became a pastor. And in 1757, at the age of 22, he wrote the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let me give you some of the words. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And then this, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. 250 years later, we still sing that hymn. But here's the rest of the story. According to some accounts, and I couldn't verify if this is just a sort of an apocryphal story or an actual story, but according to some accounts, Robert Robertson, even though he wrote that hymn, later in his life, in his 60s or so, he he struggled with his faith. By some accounts, he drifted so far away from what he had once believed and preached that he feared he could not ever return. And as the story goes, he was riding in a stagecoach one day with some strangers, and he overheard a younger woman humming his hymn. And he said to her, Madam, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago, and I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. And it said that she responded by telling him, sir, the streams of mercy are still flowing. Now here's the question for us. Is there any way in which we may have drifted in our relationship with Jesus, even by one degree? Have we drifted? Have you allowed your mind and heart to be filled with other voices, with lesser concerns? Have you neglected God's word or neglected prayer? Have you neglected or put off what you know he wants for you? Obedience is some area of serving or generosity. Confession and surrender is some attitude or behavior you know fails to honor him. Maybe you're drifting or neglecting in a relationship, marriage, your family. And today the Spirit of God through his word is saying be careful of drift. Be careful of drift. Pay attention to what you've heard. Don't neglect your salvation. We're going to close today, you see it up here, with the perfect way, I think, the perfect opportunity to pay attention. That is through the remembrance that we call communion. I'm going to pray in just a moment, then the worship team is going to lead us through one verse or two verses of that great hymn, Come Thou Fount. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. And as we listen to that hymn and you hold the elements, bread and cup, just allow the Spirit of God to speak to you and draw you back, back to shore. Let's bow in prayer. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Lord, we thank you today for your word, this, this strong warning that's really your grace in action, calling us back home. Thank you for this table, the reminder of bread and cup, and use them once again to anchor our souls deep in your salvation. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, Eric. So if there's been a sense of maybe some drift in your life and heart, and you've kind of been made aware of that today, we have our prayer team available. If you want to come and share a confidential moment of conversation and just bind your heart back to its home today, or pray about some other issue in your life or family, please feel free to do that following the benediction. And as you leave today, if you're able to contribute to our benevolent offering, all of it goes to Houston Relief. And so we appreciate your generosity uh, beforehand. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And by his grace, may our wandering hearts find their rest in him. Amen. Have a great day.